in our cause. Um, it's that when having dialogue and trying to talk about things that you readily talk about are just the facts like, uh, all around the world and things like that. Um, people will say, well, if the corporations in our country don't have power and the money's not concentrated in our country and we don't have the strongest military power and we don't do what we're doing, someone else is going to get the power and then are they going to be any better than we are? And then they're going to use their power to then exploit people, you know, violate human rights and so forth. And that, well, as bad as the United States is, they settle in a way and say that, okay, well, at least we're not too bad. Look at other people who are killing. We're not kill killing our own people and this and that. Maybe they would. And I, 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 responding to those people, I, I find it's like, well, I don't know what would happen if they had the power. I mean, other places have had the power and they have exploited that power and hurt a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So trying to accurately, um, how, would, like, how would you respond to that question? Like what would you do if we didn't have the power? And I, the, the fact that as we go to become more and more egalitarian, like if the people of our country actually exercise democracy, educated, like we're educated and they exercise democracy, um, and the, the world in the next, say, 10 to 15 years started to move towards uh, more social equality. How would we couple that and protect ourselves, essentially is the question, from a power, a dictator, or any force that could violate human rights on a mass scale? How do, how, how do those two, how can they fit well together? Yeah. I mean, first of all, um, the initial assumptions are, I don't think most people would accept, that uh, the, we have to keep on torturing and killing people because if we don't, they might torture and kill somebody. Well, you know, I mean, Hitler could have given that argument. Uh, so we don't want that one. Uh, but I think the basic question you ask is a good one. How can we, uh, if we, if we were to withdraw our own beating people over the heads with clubs, uh, would it necessarily follow that somebody else would take that role, or are there other alternatives? Oh, yeah, there are other alternatives. For example, the alternatives that are favored by the overwhelming majority of the population in the United States. Uh, I mentioned one piece of it. Uh, let the UN function. Uh, the UN isn't perfect. There's a lot of things wrong with it. Uh, just like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights isn't perfect. A lot of things wrong with it. But one step would be to let... Uh, to pay some respect to the uh, decent opinion of mankind, to quote the famous author, uh, and uh, uh, let uh, uh, international institutions function so as to reduce the likelihood that anybody will use force. After all, the, remember the UN Charter in 1945, uh, which unfortunately most people don't know, just like they don't know the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, it was formed. Uh, it starts off by saying that the goal is to save uh, the human species from the curse of war, which twice in their generation had led to vast destruction, and which, as everyone knew in 1945, uh, was, if it went on, was going to kill everybody, because this was right after the uh, uh, atom bombs. It's interesting that everyone knew that, but nobody could say it because of U.S. power. So if you look at the charter, uh, long charter, there's a lot about the curse of war, but the words uh, nuclear or, uh, uh, or any one like them don't appear. But that was what was on everyone's mind. We're at the point where we have now developed a technology that can destroy the world. Okay, so therefore we have to save ourselves from the curse of war. And institutions were constructed uh, to try to overcome just what you're pointing to. Uh, the core principles of the UN Charter are that the use of force is illegal, it's criminal. It's the supreme international crime from which all other crimes follow, unless it is used under extremely narrow conditions. Uh, one condition is authorization of the Security Council. Okay, you can ask whether that's the right way to do it or not, but it's at least some step towards the right way to do it. Uh, the only other condition was uh, if a country is under attack then you can use force and self-defense. Now, in, interest, let's come back to ourselves today. In the United States, the elite intellectual culture, the one we're part of, flatly rejects that. 
and says that the United States and alone, maybe we can delegate it to our clients, but essentially the United States alone uh, has the right of what's called anticipatory self-defense, meaning we attack anyone we want because we claim that maybe they'll be a threat to us someday. Uh, that's flatly in violation of the Charter. It's the bipartisan consensus. It's the media consensus. It's the elite intellectual consensus, not 100 percent, but uh, you know, overwhelmingly. And then people just argue about, well, you know, is this or that the right place to do it? But the, and of course, nobody else is allowed to have that right. I mean, that's outlandish, you know, like that Nicaragua, say, would have had the right to carry out terror in the United States and legitimate self-defense is unthinkable. Uh, so uh, the, but uh, we have that right just for ourselves. We can delegate it to clients. But I'll say the same thing I said before. The overwhelming majority of the population rejects that. Uh, you take a look at the unpublished, almost always unpublished, major studies of public opinion. Um, these, in fact, were released right before the election, uh, when they were crucially important for a democratic society, but suppressed, uh, show that a uh, large majority of the public uh, accepts the basic principles of the UN Charter uh, against the uh, use of force. Uh, and if we're in a better position to implement those principles than anyone else because we're way more powerful than anyone else. So if we join the rest of the world in trying to implement those principles, then there's hope that no other power will take the place that the powerful states now have, us in particular. And there are many examples of this. I'll just take one exa another example from last November, which also didn't get reported, and we should ask why. Uh, and there is a... Uh, fissile material cutoff treaty. It's a treat, international treaty that tries to prevent the, uh, to put, t there are technically, you know, treaties blocking it, but, there, but this one would put some enforcement procedures into preventing the uh, development of materials for nuclear weapons, okay? You read on the front pages of the New York Times this morning, lead story, uh, the U.S. wants to prevent its enemies, like Iran, from even getting the rights they now have with regard to making uh, these materials. But there is a, on the agenda a much broader one, which tries to prevent, uh, to cut off the production of uh, material which can be used for nuclear weapons, which are very likely to destroy us all. Well, it, uh, it's been negotiated for years internationally. It came to a a vote at the general, what amounts to the General Assembly, the Disarmament Commission of the uh, General Assembly, it's the whole General Assembly. It came to a vote last November, and uh, the vote was uh, 147 to 1 uh, with two abstentions. Uh, 147 to 1 is very typical of international votes, not this administration, going way back. Uh, or maybe you know, 150 to 2 or something like that, uh, because the U.S. Uh, does uh, insist upon rights that it denies to everyone else, like the right to use force, the right to commit genocide, and so on and so forth. In this case, uh, the United States voted against, uh, on, it was the only country to vote against the uh, 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 measures to enforce the restriction on production of uh, weapons, of material for nuclear weapons, which is likely to destroy us all. Well, uh, the, what about the two states that abstained? Uh, one of them abstains reflexively. Israel has to abstain because it's relying on the United States for whatever it's doing, so that's reflexive. The other one is a second client state, Britain. And Britain abstained, which it usually does, in fact, abstained on the Security Council resolutions on Nicaragua too and many others. And in fact, the British representative, if you look at the General Assembly proceedings, explained why he had to abstain. He said, we're very much in favor of this uh, treaty, and you know, we're going to work really hard to get enforcement procedures and so on. But the particular proposal that was voted on, he said, is divisive, which is true. It divided the world 147 to 1. Uh, so therefore, he, he, he had to abstain. Well, you know, uh, these things are under our control. Uh, we could change all those policies, and the overwhelming majority of the population doesn't want to change them. Uh, but in order to change them, we have to do something about it. And uh, that's in direct re reaction to your question. We do not want, nobody's saying 
wants any country to be developing uh, the kinds of weaponry which will destroy all of us. And one way to prevent that is by putting enforcement mechanisms into the uh, vague treaties that bar it. But the U.S. won't allow that, uh, and it is allowed to get away with it because nobody in the country knows it. I bet if you do a poll at, uh, you know, say, Harvard Faculty Club or wherever educated people are, you, you, unless it's somebody who's involved in, you know, disarmament programs, nobody will have ever heard of this. And it, it's, it's like a death sentence, and it happens all the time. 